Let me tell you first an anecdote from my ministry. I once moved to a congregation that uh, I found soon seemed to have a great deal of weakness in the education, the spiritual education, the biblical education that our young people, the teenagers and those that were in that category had. And so having discovered that and been deeply concerned about it, I convinced the elders to let me teach the teens. My question that was in my mind was when I first started examining their background of knowledge, my question was, what on earth have these teachers that have had these young people in elementary and middle school and now in high school ages, what have they been teaching in Bible class? They didn't seem to get anything communicated. What were they doing? How did they fail? That really was in my mind. And I was determined, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to educate them. I'm going to make sure they learn everything they need to know. Within about two years, I was convinced I knew what those teachers who'd gone before me had been doing. I was convinced of what they had been trying to do. They had been trying to teach these kids. They had been offering them the instruction and the teaching that they needed. The young people just hadn't been assimilating it at all. And they didn't get it in those two years either. They were still immature spiritually. They were still not grasping what they needed to know to prepare them to live for the Lord. And I finally had to accept, I can't do this. And I walked away from the teenage class, went back to adults, and I don't know what happened to the kids. Every teacher finds himself or herself at some time or another, and maybe very often, dealing with that same kind of issue. Are they getting it? Are, am I putting it so that they understand? Is it getting through to them? Maybe that's part of what tests are about so far as the benefit to the teacher is concerned is are they getting it? It ought to be that. What, what kind of job am I doing? Is the best I can do good enough? Will they ever get it? When I said every teacher, it seems implicit in that, but needs to be spelled out that Jesus is included in that overall statement. The great master teacher, the one who was such a teacher that often when people, even those very close to him, addressed him, they didn't address him by name. The apostles didn't say, hey Jesus, when they wanted his attention, when they wanted to make a statement in the group, it wasn't that they'd say, Jesus, they would say, teacher, teacher, and draw his attention to them. He was so much a teacher. The greatest teacher who ever lived. And yet, I think John 14 is to a large extent a report of the fact that Jesus wondered then, are they getting it? They've just had the experience where he washed their feet. And we studied about that a couple of Sunday nights ago. And he talked to them about the responsibilities that they were going to have and what was going to occur. And, and Peter had heard Jesus say before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And they've had that 
discussion connected with that. And when John starts this chapter, and he didn't write it in chapters, but that's how we have it. Jesus gave them a profound statement, and then they started to discuss it. I want to suggest that in this chapter, there's kind of an application of what we're talking about when sometimes we sing the song to have a little talk with Jesus. We do that in prayer, of course, and that's what we're referring to when we sing it. But what we've got here in chapter 17 is, is as if we've got the camera shining in where they are assembled, and we are picking up everything that's happening, and what this amounts to is a conversation that they have with Jesus. The apostles are having a little talk with Jesus. As at very, the very end of it, Jesus says, we're not going to talk anymore like this. This is our last conversation that we'll talk like this and so it's very insightful as to what they talked about and it starts when Jesus said let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me for in my father's house there are Many mansions, the King James Version says. Other translations say, there are many rooms. And I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there, you may be also. If it were not true, would I have told you? He said, and, and where I'm going, you know, and the way you know. That's how that all starts. Jesus is starting out seeking to comfort them and to reassure them. And incidentally, he must wonder that about us sometimes. Are we getting it? And consequently, this is by inspiration included in the Scripture so that by it we also may be comforted. Let not your heart be troubled. He's saying, be at peace. Be at peace. Don't, don't be full of anxiety but feel secure, just as secure as you do about the things you believe in God. Believe that firmly in me as well. As you believe in God, believe also in me. He urges that they believe in God, but he's dealing now with their faith in him. Believe in me also in the same way. In my Father's house, and we we think of that as heaven. Of course, house implies to us a, a material, physical house, like where we go when we leave here, and we have our meals, and we sleep, and all of that. But it really, in this case, it, it relates to family, more than a physical house, to the family, and relates more to the eternal existence with God the ultimate that we call heaven. And it's like saying there's room for everyone. There's space. Those spiritual things don't require space. But he's saying no one has to be left out. They might have later recalled that whenever he said, go to them and to go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Go therefore and teach all nations and baptize them and teach them some more. Realizing it's not just a Jewish situation. It's not just for the apostles and a few people, but this is all inclusive. There's room for everyone. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. Trust and don't worry. There's a place for you. And he said, I'm going there to ensure it. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And just as surely as I go, I will come again. That's a kind of a two-edged sword. Because on the one hand, as he's saying that that day or that night, as the case may have been, he's talking about, I'm going to be crucified soon and I'll be buried and raised again on the third day. He'd already told him he'd be raised again the third day. They said, you won't even be killed, much less be raised on the third day. And that's letting him know they're not really getting it. 
But now he's iterating that in another way and saying, I'm going away, but I will come again. I'll come so you can go where I'm going. They must have thought of that when he came again on the third day, raised from the dead. But the long-range message of that is that he's gone away now, and he's coming again. In whichever time frame you look at it, it's a, a message of peace, a message of reassurance, of comfort. I will not leave you without help and provision. And there'll be room for everybody. And you know where I'm going. And you know the way to get there. And that's whenever they began to talk. And Philip said, uh, or was it Thomas first said, I, we, uh, Lord, we don't know what you're talking about, basically what he said. We don't know where you're going, and how could we possibly be expected to know the way? And Jesus said, I, I am the way and the truth and the life. You see, if you need a road map, if you need a pattern, if you need instruction, if you need something that pictures it for you, it, it's me. I am the way, I'm the path. I'm like the road map. I'm like the atlas. I'm like how you get from here to where we're going. You just follow me. Later, Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 2, 21, even to this have you been called because Christ also suffered and died for us, leaving us an example that we should walk in his footsteps. I am the way. If you want to know how to live, this is the way. I'm living like God wants a man to live. I've come so that I could display to you exactly what God wants a man to be. I am the way. How do I live? Live like Jesus. What are my perspectives, my values to be? The same as Jesus. What do I focus on? The same as Jesus. What are my goals? The same as Jesus. I'm the way. What do I believe? How do I know what to trust? I am the truth also, he said. He's introduced that way by John. In the Gospel of John, when John starts, he said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same was with God in the beginning. By Him were all things made that were made, and without Him it was not anything made that was made. He identified Him further in verse 14 when He said, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld Him as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's explaining that Jesus is the truth. It came out in the first chapter. I am the way, the truth. And now the Word is the truth. And Jesus himself in John 17, in his famous prayer to God for these disciples and for us, in verse 17, said, Father, sanctify them by the truth. Thy Word is truth. And Jesus and the truth are interchangeable terms. They are inseparable they are the same in impact. The Word of God that's quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, according to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, is in Jesus. I am the way, I'm the truth, and if you want to know how to live, I'm the life. It is in me that you'll have life, spiritual life, but I'll display you how to live. We saw last Sunday night that in chapter 10, when he talked about the good shepherd in verse 10, he said, I am come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is saying to Thomas, you get there through me. I display it all. Well, the conversation kind of turned from that. Philip said, well, Lord, that's, 
how, we, we understand what you're saying, but it's hard to grasp, really. So he said, would, would you just show us the Father? You know, talk about being the master of understatement. I think he's captured it right there. All we ask, this, this one little thing, is, uh, is, this is all it'll take, and, and then we're going to believe you. Here's Thomas, who later said, I won't believe he's raised from the dead unless I stick my hand into his side. And right there in that same conversation, Philip said, just, 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 just show us the Father. Show us God. That sounds so profound, and you would think, doesn't he get it? And Jesus must have been thinking that because he, he, he shows astonishment almost when he said, have I been with you this long? Have we done all these things together, and you don't yet grasp it? That if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. My Father and I are one. I, I, I display Him, the Hebrew writer would explain in the very first part of the book of Hebrews, verse 3 of chapter 1, that He, this one, He said that, that through whom God revealed the truth, He said that, I'll just go back to one and down to three, where he talked about the fact that God at sundry times and diverse manners in times past spoke to the fathers by the prophets, but he hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath given to be heir over all things, and by whom he also created the heavens and the earth. And then he goes on in verse 3 to say that the Son was exact reflection or image of the Father. He's saying if you looked at Jesus, it was like looking in the mirror and seeing God. Because that, that was the idea. He, he portrayed God precisely and perfectly. He was the very image of his Father. Once in a while you see some of these guys around here and other places. And you don't even have to know who their daddy is. You know who they are. You don't have to know who their granddaddy is. You can see the child and you know who the granddaddy is because the, the seed is, is stretching that far. There's a guy around here that when I see him walk, I see his granddaddy. And I see his great granddaddy. Because he walks like they both do. He's the reflection. He's not planning it. It's just in there. And Jesus was the exact image of God. And he said, besides, if you didn't get it by the teachings that you've heard, by now you should have got it from the miracles you've seen. The works. The teachings and the works and... and it, it, no man comes to the Father, he said, but by me. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father, but by me. In the conversation, the man said, well, just show us the Father. And Jesus is effectively saying, I have, I have. But still, they're needing more. I'm going to, there's some conversation that Jesus puts in that, Thomas said, and Philip said, and next Jesus said, but I want to jump what Jesus said a bit right now and go down into 12, verse 12, 14, somewhere in there. There's another person introduced here, and he's, he's Judas, not Iscariot, in the group. And he responds, Jesus has, in fact, implied to them that they... Uh, He's, he's going to, when he comes again, they will recognize him, but the world wants. And so Judas, not Iscariot, wanted to know, how is it? Explain this statement to me. 
How is it that we will recognize you when you come back and the world will not recognize you? What is it that will distinguish us from the world so that we have this insight that they don't have? Now, in my opinion, that's the first really good question that shouldn't have already been answered and yet, in a sense, it had been in the previous conversations Jesus had in chapter 14 and chapter 13 explained, by this will men know you're my disciples. He already said, here's a distinguishing mark. In verse 35, he explained it is, well, because you love each other. But now he defines it further. He said, the way that you are separated from the rest... What makes you different is the fact that you love me and you keep my commandments. And that's when he said in verse 15, if you, are, if you do love me, you'll keep my commandments. 14, he said, if you're my friend, you'll keep my commandments. But he said, that's the distinguishing mark that exists for people who really are my followers, is that they love me enough to keep my commandments. And that's why, when I come again, you will know. But he said there's more to that when he responded. He had told them that when Jesus said, begins back there earlier, he had said that this will not be a permanent separation. And I'll come. And he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will send a helper to you. And we, when he comes, he said the helper is going to help you in all the ways that you need. And he didn't iterate it exactly that way, but he pretty much said, and obviously one of the ways you're going to need to be helped most is you're going to need to remember what I told you. What he's going to do, he said, first of all, he will bring to your memory all things whatsoever I have commanded you. I never saw that just that way before. But in this conversation, it sounds like Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit is really going to need to shake you up because you don't seem to have it yet. But by miracle, the Holy Spirit will bring to your memory all the things that I've taught you. What you've been not getting and forgetting, he'll, he'll bring that back to you. And then he said, if there's anything else you need to know, he's going to give you that too. So it's not like I'm going away and leaving you helpless. In fact, he went on to say, I will not leave you, and I love this expression, I will not leave you orphans. You won't be cut off and left by yourself because the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit is going to come. And he said, I'm telling you all of this before it happens so that when it happens, you can recognize it. I don't want any of this. I went away and I was raised from the dead and then on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came and, and it went swoosh over your head and you didn't get it. I'm telling you about this early because I want you to get it. You have to get it. You have to understand and you have to recognize when the Holy Spirit comes what this is about and for what it is given. And then he said, I want you to understand that I'm leaving you with my peace. I'm leaving you with my comfort. I'm leaving you a path and a way and a hope. And what you have to do now is love me enough to keep my commandments. And when you do that, then you become the ones who inherit. You become the sons and daughters of God who then are part of his family and who will ultimately be transferred from this earth into his realm of eternal existence into his household into what we come to know in further study of the scripture as heaven. What a lesson that is. In this conversation with Jesus, 
that these disciples had is recorded for us in hopes that we'll get it, that we will understand, comprehend, appreciate the peace of Jesus Christ that passes understanding, that we will understand the importance of identifying with Him as the way, the truth, and the life, and subscribing to no other philosophy of life except His, and subscribing to no other philosophy of life than Christianity, and serving Him and following our fellow man as well, and doing good things and bringing peace and preaching and teaching, but always with faith in Him as we have faith in God, that He hasn't left us alone, but that He's left us with hope through His blood and His offering of His life for us and the presence of the Holy Spirit within our lives to comfort us while we abide upon this earth displaying that we love Him above all. Oh, what an impacting lesson that should have been for them and now is left for us. That Jesus is all in all. I am the pathway. I am the way to live. I am the hope. And if you're looking for truth, find it in God's Word. Because I am parallel with. I am synonymous with truth. What I teach you and what I command you and what I ask you to do is parallel. It is synonymous with truth because I am the essence myself of truth, Jesus said. No wonder we should take seriously the call of Jesus. Come unto me, all you that labor and the heavy laden, I'll give you rest. His urging us to be born of the again of the water and the Spirit. To change our lives and give them to Him. To not focus on this earth and the here and now and the material things, but to remember our hope that is in transition into a spiritual existence that is eternal with Him and the Father forever in the family of God and that existence that only those who love Him and obey Him can share, impacting. But I ask you now, did you, did you get it? Did it communicate? Did it ever communicate? If you, one who's never become a child of God, did, did that communicate this time? Did, did it resonate? Do you understand? the importance of the love of God for your soul and the extent to which He went to give you hope of eternal life and a chance to be saved if you'll believe, repent, and be baptized for the remission of sins. Did you get that this time? If you're a child of God and you take lightly the business of serving the Lord and you may often put other things first, even other people first before him. Did you get this? Did you understand that he's the only way? He's the only truth. He's the only life and the only hope. Don't forfeit that relationship in eternity for some fun here, for some material things here, for some connections here. Don't jeopardize the peace that lasts forever for a bit of pleasure. Did you get it? If you need to repent as a child of God, if you need to be rededicated to the Lord, restored, if you need to start again, did you get it? How important it is that we walk in that path with Him. Now, in order that we may do so forevermore. And that may start right in the aisle, down that path to give your heart to the Lord here and let us help you. If you're not a child of God, study with you further, help you understand more if you feel you need to. 
or to help you as you're baptized even this day. There's a child of God to counsel and encourage, to beg for your soul, to have you restored. And pray together with you for the forgiveness of your sins and hope of heaven. If you need to change, to display, yes, I got it. It starts right at the end of the pew where you're seated. And we invite you to come while we stand and sing the invitation song.